Hey, and uh, just to share a few words about our, our service and the scripture. Um, today we're going to be reading a, a fairly familiar story, I think, about one of the post-resurrection uh, times for Jesus, when on that very first day after the resurrection, later in the day, there were two disciples who were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and, and a stranger came up to them, and later they found out it was Jesus. And so as we think about that, that story and, and the way it forms our, our faith, we realize that sometimes Jesus shows up in our lives and we don't recognize, we don't recognize God. And so I wanted to invite you, even as we prepare for the prelude, to be thinking about the blessings or the moments in your life when the disciples describe it, their hearts were burning. I wonder how God has appeared to us. I wonder how the Lord has been with us in moments we may not have noticed. So I invite you, um, as we come to worship, as we hear the prelude, let's be looking and listening for the presence of God.
Oh God, we are thankful for the love that you pour out for us. The love you pour out for us in Jesus. In the teachings, in the life, in the death, in the resurrection, and in the glory. The glory of risen life. We are also thankful for the love that you pour out for us here and now through our families, through our church family, through our community. We pray through our mothers. We pray, O God, that love would abound among us as you've lived for us, as you've given us the example. Help us. Help us to care, to care enough, to sacrifice, to care enough, to, to go beyond what's expected, to, to make the lives of others better. Oh God, teach us to love in this way, as we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, the 23rd chapter. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, he restores my soul. He guides me in path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yeah. Let us pause uh, for a brief moment of silence to prepare ourselves for our unison confession. Join me now in the bulletin, our unison confession. Gracious God, in Jesus Christ, you came as our good shepherd to show us the way. You walk with us in the most harrowing of times, but we often go our own way, seeking our own rewards and refreshments in things that deplete our health, damage our relationships, and demoralize our spirits. Forgive us, gracious God. Call us back with the voice of your word. Lead us home by the light of your spirit. Reveal your presence and raise us up in righteousness, so that we may show your glory, do your will, and sing your praises. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And now Nancy will have our children's story. Good morning. I was afraid if I sat here, I wouldn't get up. Do you know what today is? Very good, Olivia. It is Mother. And God gave us mothers, which we celebrate today, too. And God had a mother. You know God's mother's name? Very good, yes. And mothers, they love us unconditionally. Only God can love you more than your mother. 
can you tell me some of the things that mothers do for us? Mothers give hugs. Hugs are important too. And love. Does she, does mother buy her clothes? And toys? And other favorite things like candy or cookies. And she washes our clothes and keeps us clean. Mothers even laugh and play with us. And they laugh with us. Yes. And in the same way that mothers know and care and help us, God also <laughs> knows us and cares for us and helps us. And in Proverbs 31, 28, it says, Her children rise up and call her blessed. And your mother is blessed, isn't she? Now, can we bow our heads? And then I have something for you to do. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord God, we ask you to bless all mothers on this special day. Bring love to their heart and health to their body. Amen. I have some flowers over here. Oh God, at this at this very moment we think of, of those we know who, who are walking through life, walking through challenges, or walking through hard times, perhaps even facing death. And we pray, O oh Lord, that, that the love and the heart of Jesus, that you yourself would be revealed to them in their walking, in their struggles, in their challenges. We pray for those who need your physical healing, your physical strength to get through this time. We pray for those who have been, are in broken relationships, who need your love to offer forgiveness or to be forgiven. And we pray for those who, for those who may have lost faith, for those who may be looking for you and not able to find your presence. We pray that you would be revealed, O oh God. We pray. We pray, O oh God, even as Jesus, even as you taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, our New Testament reading this morning is taken from the 24th chapter of Luke, verses 13 through 34. <clears throat> now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleos asked him, are you the only visitor aid? in Jerusalem and do not know the things that have been happened in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. 
The chief priest and the other other rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But he but we had hopes that he would be the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since the, this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found that just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe that all that the prophets had spoken did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scripture concerning himself. As they approached the village in which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going to uh, walk further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in with them and stayed with them. When he, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned to Jerusalem at once. Then there they found the, tw the eleven and those with them assembled together and say, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. This um, is a really classic story, a classic story of these post-resurrection appearances. And, and, and so there's a couple of these that are just, they're, they're powerful stories. They're wonderful stories about how Jesus just kind of out of nowhere appeared to the disciples, whether they were in a locked room or whether they were on the beach. Or he was on the beach and they were fishing. He was actually making breakfast for them in that story from John chapter 21. But these stories are, are just, they're kind of mysterious. So on this first day of the week, the disciples, and they're not the 12, one of the 12 disciples, but one of the followers of Jesus, two of the followers of Jesus, were given the name Cleopas of one of them. They were going to a place seven miles away, give or take. And as they're walking from Jerusalem on the second, first day of the week, on the first day of the week, on Sunday, all of a sudden a stranger comes up and walks with them. Some of the interesting little moments in the scripture is, it, it says, in, in, it's translated in the New Revised Standard, that they were prevented from seeing Jesus, prevented from recognizing him. That's really interesting, isn't it? It's also interesting, the irony of it, you know, this is Jesus talking with them about things that he had experienced, but there's this veil that they don't realize it's Jesus, and they don't realize that he experienced all of this firsthand. And it's also very interesting, it's kind of the first, first proclamation of the gospel. Who, who was Jesus? Well, he was a prophet mighty indeed before God and before the people. And then it, it goes on to say that he was crucified. The Jews crucified him and there's word, there's word that something is stirring. This morning people went to the tomb and they found it empty and they saw messengers, angels from God. It's the first full length description of who Jesus is and what happened at the crucifixion and the hint of the resurrection. And then finally, I'm, I'm also most intrigued by toward the end, you know, whenever they prevail upon him and he goes into the house with them and they sit down at the table together, Luke and Jesus, he uses the very exact same words that he used in the Last Supper in the upper room in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. The four verbs are exactly the same as from the Last Supper, where we remember from the communion service. He took bread, 
He blessed, he broke, he gave it. And in that gift, in that receiving and sharing of bread, all of a sudden they recognize him. All of a sudden they, they see it's Jesus and he's gone. Just like that. One of the things this, the story stirs in me is just thinking about how we see Jesus or how we don't see Jesus. Are we prevented from seeing the presence of God here among us, here and now? What are the moments when our spirits are enlightened and all of a sudden the veil's lifted and we realize, oh, this is a holy moment. How do we see Jesus? I had to think about church traditions a little. Um, there's kind of a continuum in church traditions and, and, and how we feel that this presence of God is revealed in worship. And one of those extremes is, is the Quaker, the Quaker tradition, the tradition of the friends. In the friends tradition, they don't practice Typically, they don't practice sacraments at all. They don't baptize. They don't have communion. They don't wash feet. They don't do any of those things that we think of as, as sacraments. And, and we don't actually think of them. It's kind of a complicated story. But let me talk about this one extreme first. And, and the Quakers, in their thinking, they would say, let your life speak. In other words, you don't have to talk about your faith, but let people see your faith in the way you live. I think most of us brethren would agree with that. They would really kind of draw, draw encouragement from the story of Jesus and the woman at the well in John 4, where Jesus said, you know, the day is coming when all people will worship me in spirit and in truth. And so for the Quakers and the friends, you don't have to come to a sanctuary to worship. You can worship God anywhere. They really stand on that statement from Jesus. And they also stand on the verse from John the Baptist, where it says, I'm baptizing you with water, but one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so they don't worry so much about the water. They're more interested in the Holy Spirit and the fire. You understand why for Quakers and the friends, finding God isn't something you just do in a church or in a meeting house. It's something you do every day, wherever you are, with whatever you're doing. Now, the other extreme in this continuum would be the high church tradition, the tradition that you might see in the Catholic Church or in the Episcopal Church, the Orthodox Church. And in their life together, there are sacraments. And a sacrament is an outward expression of an inward spiritual truth. But in their tradition, they go into great detail in making sure the sacraments are performed in just the right way. In the high church tradition, you have to have an ordained minister for baptism or for communion. No one else will do. That ordination is the laying on of hands that is a succession that goes back to Peter himself in their tradition. The other thing is there's a very finely detailed rubric about what you do, how you fold the cloth and, and the words you say. You may have heard in the news a few months ago, there was a priest out in the, one of the Western states who kind of inadvertently took the the baptism service in a little brethren direction. I think this is, in a way, this is not funny at all, but it seems a little amusing to me. He changed a word in the rubric from, I baptize you, representing his ordination and his authority as a priest, and instead he said, we baptize you, representing the church and the authority of the body of Christ. But in their tradition, that just, it wouldn't do. And those baptisms were nullified. They weren't legitimate because he changed a single word. And that gives you kind of a sense of the spirit. That everything is very, very detailed, and everything has to be performed 
just in this certain way for it to truly reveal Jesus. We brethren come in the middle there. We're probably a little closer to the Quaker end, not quite that far. We believe that God is revealed one of them, one of the primary ways was in the gathering of believers, in the Gemeinschaft, the German word for it is Gemeinschaft, that, that in the gathering of believers, the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit inspires and interprets the scripture through believers. The early brethren, those first eight, met for Bible study for a long time before God revealed to them in their gathering that they should go out to the Ader, out to the stream, and to be baptized. It was something they discerned in community together. And so, annual conference kind of evolved out of that sense of discerning the will and the word and the meaning of God together. In our church, the, the vote of annual conference is the highest authority because we feel it it speaks for and with the discernment of God. How is Jesus revealed? We too, kind of like the Quakers, have felt that this is a meeting house. Well, we, we use the term sanctuary, but really it's a meeting house. And it's not necessarily any more sacred than anywhere else. There was a time in our history when people met in homes. They actually made, made doorways so that you could open up doorways and, and make rooms bigger so you could have a gathering of believers within your home. So there was really nothing special about the place. What mattered was the heart of the believers who gathered. And in the bread, we have experienced a, a holy time in love feast and in communion. We, we would, I think we all feel that, that God is revealed in that. And, and I actually, I loved Elaine's sharing a couple of weeks ago whenever she opened it up. So what was feet washing like to you? And, and it was clear that we've all experienced the presence of God, the love of Jesus in the act of feet washing. But what we do together symbolizes what we do apart. And so when we serve our neighbor, that is just as holy as kneeling down and washing feet together in the, in the church. What we do apart in the spirit and in the love of, of God is just as holy as what we do together in the church. And so it doesn't surprise us at all that two guys walking down the road would encounter Jesus any more than it would surprise us that we would encounter Jesus where we work or in our homes or where we, where we, where we recreate, where we live, where we work. I was really tempted. I thought about having bread again, bread and cup, because the story just begs for it, you know? Whenever they broke the bread, he was revealed. But instead of doing that, I'm going to encourage you. I think sometimes I, sometimes I think slicing bread just ruins it, you know? <laughs> it ruins the spirit of it. I want to invite you to think, to try this. Try finding a loaf of homemade bread or making some yourself. Try making a loaf of bread. And if you can find a friend or with your family in the initial time of your meal and after you share a blessing, just take, take and pass it around and break bread, remembering, in remembrance. For us, instead of emphasizing with communion, instead of emphasizing that the blood is the blood of Christ, and the bread is the body of Christ. For us, it's more about remembering. Remembering the love of Jesus that led him to the cross and led him to give his very life for us. 
in the breaking of bread at any meal time, we can remember and it can be holy. In the first, second chapter of Acts, there's a passage that kind of gives a summary of the early church's experience after Pentecost. And in that summary, we see and, and we hear that the Spirit of God was working where they taught, where the disciples taught in the temple, but God was working in all of their gatherings. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. They were generous. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. How is God revealed? God's revealed in love. I, I pray God is revealed in the love of a mother and child or the love of, a, of an adult child caring for an elderly mom. God's love is revealed in the sharing of fellowship, in the sharing of food. God's love is revealed in the breaking of bread. Whether it's at communion in a sanctuary or whether it's around the table at home. The prayer I find myself praying from this scripture is help me to see. May your spirit not prevent us, Lord. Don't prevent us from seeing, from seeing the presence of Jesus. Let's pray. God, help us to, to really see into the story how glad you are to be with us. How glad Jesus was to walk with these two followers and to show them, to teach them how you were foretold and what it meant. We pray, O oh Lord, that and if we've been unable to see you, to feel your presence, or to understand your purpose, to, to know your will, or if we've been unable to really believe in the resurrection or any, any of these truths from Scripture, may you come into our hearts, come into our spirits, and help us to see. Help us to see you revealed. we ask in the name of the one who died and rose again and lives with you forever. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So we celebrate the resurrection of God.
Would you join me in our unison blessing from the bulletin? May our good shepherd lead us. May God open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to believe that we belong to God, who is with us now and always. Let us go on our way rejoicing.